very good morning to you and welcome back to the morning latte show and of course in this segment we have our game changers of the day and they're coming from transparency international zimbabwe and the swedish embassy of zimbabwe today we're going to be talking about the jetted corruption barometer in zimbabwe how far has corruption come in terms of actually affecting women's day-to-day -day activities and we have muchaneta mundoba who's the executive director of Transparency International Zimbabwe. We have Fadzai Jekemu, who's the programs officer of Transparency International Zimbabwe. And of course, we have Metasuna Gren, and I cannot pronounce her name properly, <laughs> the head of development corporation uh, of the Embassy of Sweden in Zimbabwe. Welcome, ladies. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, you. Uh, thank you so much for coming through. And today, your game changes. Isn't thank that you. brilliant? <laughs> All right, so it's interesting, uh, yesterday when I, I got the, the script, talking about the gendered corruption barometer in Zimbabwe, it seems like a very big word, but basically we're breaking it down to talk about, you know, how far corruption has come in terms of impacting uh, women. So uh, I'll start off with Transparency International uh, Zimbabwe. Who is uh, TIZ? Okay, thank you, Yannick. Um, TIZ is the local chapter of the global movement against corruption. Right. We're currently operating in three regions, mm -hmm. Harare, Blawayo, and Mutare. Right. We use a five-unit model to carry out our work. We have uh, the unit, which is called the research unit, mm -hmm. which is giving us the, the gendered barometer research. We have the community mobilization and advocacy unit, right. which goes into the communities and teach people about anti-corruption laws right. and empower them to be able to resist, reject, and report corruption. Corruption. Right. Then we have the Advocacy and Legal Advice Center, mm -hmm. which is an initiative that offers free legal advice to witnesses and uh, victims mm -hmm. of corruption. Right. Then we have what we call the BLIM unit, which mm -hmm. is the Policy, Legislation, and Institutional Monitoring Unit, mm -hmm. which seeks to, to bring out policies, anti-corruption policies, to better Zimbabwe. And then you also have the communications unit, mm -hmm. which now gels everything together and uh, gives it out to anti-corruption stakeholders. So within this five-unit model, we do, not, we do not operate in silos, right. but we operate as a unit uh, so that we churn out anti-corruption material that is relevant to the stakeholders in Zimbabweans at large. Oh, wow, that's brilliant. And of course, I'll go to um, Meta. Tell us a bit, a bit about your work at the Swedish Embassy. So being the head of development cooperation, I oversee our whole, all of our interventions towards mm -hmm. development in Zimbabwe. Right. And uh, what we work with, one of our main sectors is what we call democracy, human rights, rule of law and gender equality. Mm -hmm. And in there, anti-corruption is of course a key issue. Right. Because nothing really works if you have rampant corruption. Yes. And we also work with other sectors where corruption is also quite an important factor for not making these sectors come to their full potential. Mm -hmm. Equal health, sexual reproductive health, uh, s even issues like environment, climate change, yes. livelihoods and resilience. Right. Wow, that's brilliant. Okay, so, I mean, getting into uh, the conversation, of course, talking about the gendered corruption barometer in Zimbabwe, um, I mean... What inspired this study around gender and corruption? Okay, thank you. I think like quite Matt said, um, we have been getting funding from the embers of Sweden since yes. 2012. Right. And since then, we've been carrying out various studies. Mm -hmm. For example, in 2012, we had an annual state of corruption report focusing on mining. Right. In 2014, we had a barometer on youth and corruption. Mm -hmm. In 2016, we did a study on women, land, and corruption. Right. As well as uh, through our work in communities and also from ALAC, we gathered that there are various nuances surrounding women and corruption. Mm -hmm. So we decided to do an in-depth study surrounding gender and corruption to find out different ways in which corruption impacts women mm -hmm. um, from men. Right. I think as we all know, I think uh, corruption impacts on the less uh, fortunate or disadvantaged groups mostly yes. and women constitute the the bigger chunk of the less uh, disadvantaged right mainly because they are the primary caregivers yes. they interact with service providers mm -hmm. almost daily compared to men yes. going to school they interact with the 
education officers mm -hmm. they rely on water i think there's a shortage of water these yes. days yes. they're the ones who go to the boreholes to fetch water mm -hmm. they go to the hospitals taking care of the babies etc so in our various works we discovered that women are impacted by corruption differently right. that's what inspired us to have an in-depth analysis so that you can also offer policies that try to address the issue of gender and corruption i think that's a brilliant initiative and i'll, I'll throw this question to Mete talking about corruption how does Sweden define corruption? The short version is abuse of trust, power and position for improper gains. Mm. And of course within that you can see all kinds of things. It's the bribe, extortion, conflicts of interest, nepotism, right. that you're asking little fees here and there. It's a wide range of issues. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, all right, so um, going back to Muchaneta, let's talk about the areas uh, that you focused on and which sectors when we're talking about corruption. Okay, in this study, we focused on uh, service delivery mainly, right. and we focused on corruption in the health. Mm -hmm. Although it was not a broad study focusing on health in the broadest terms, yes. we touched on health, we touched with, on women with disabilities. Mm -hmm. I know in as much as women were affected by corruption, imagine the extra burden of living with disabilities ability as mm -hmm, well mm -hmm. and interfacing that with corruption right we also uh, touched on poverty and social welfare yes we also touched on education and water and housing you know wh why did you specifically focus on these sectors okay and if i say will answer that question <laughs> <laughs> yes well, that. Like what uh, mate said uh, it's to do with service delivery right to basic services right and within these sectors that's where we get our main basic services yes so that's why we focused on those health uh, mm -hmm. access to water access to education Okay. All right. So, Meta, let's talk about uh, Sweden's position uh, on gender and corruption. What is your position? Well, since we think that corruption is a major um, infringement for development for yes. everybody, and as we heard before here, women are most often the most vulnerable, those who care for others, mm -hmm. who sort of take the brunt of everything you have to do to, to protect your family yes. and, and move forward. Yes. So, if they are uh, how shall I say, subjected to this corruption, mm -hmm. their way to treat for themselves or care for themselves and their families get hampered. Mm. And no one gets beyond that. And I think another aspect of that is particular for women is the sextortion and yes. how women are the, the use of uh, the misuse of power mm. by, by many men in forcing them into sexual activities that they don't really want yes. to get whatever thing and so it's not always money I think although of course money is often a part of it and therefore to in order to strengthen and empower women we have to work with them not only to be able to uh, to tell when they mm -hmm. are getting subjected mm -hmm. for this and yes. find the ways for address and means for that but also to know to say no and to be able to actually see well I shouldn't be paying this extra fee yes. or I shouldn't do this or yes. it's not right for me to to do whatever this man wants me to do mm. uh, in a sexual way I, I would have the right to get these things anyway mm -hmm. and therefore I think that women in general needs more empowerment than men and especially when it comes to corruption you know, it's interesting, um, um, Meta, you're talking about women actually being educated around issues to do with corruption and obviously saying that, you know what, I have the right to get these uh, things or to have service delivery for free. But then what happens when you have this vicious cycle where everyone is now being corrupt? Mm -hmm. And even if you say, okay, fine, I'm not going to pay you, you won't receive that thing. How do we then, because it starts from a top level, it has a, a ripple effect. How do we fight against that? Okay. Uh, Okay, maybe I'll answer that. <laughs> I totally agree with you mm -hmm. to say that as Zimbabweans, we have normalized corruption yes, yes. and it has become sort of part and parcel of you getting service delivery right and that should not be the case yes we have condoned uh, certain things that are wrong to be right yes so uh, partly it's because of the level of impunity that's the mm. that is uh, given to people who are politically exposed right we see politically exposed people being given scot free mm. or you're brought to court but the case just disappears like that or nothing yes. is done yes. so the ordinary person also now comes and say everyone is doing it therefore I should do it mm -hmm. but then also that is an attitude problem that is wrong right. that is perpetuating the problem right. we should also have an attitude problem as ordinary citizens mm -hmm. corruption starts with me and you yes. ending corruption similarly ends, starts with me and you so I think we all have a role to play no matter at what stage we are within the anti-corruption mm -hmm. chain mm -hmm. 
we have CC Marilyn uh, D saying excellent discussion on how women uh, bear the brunt on corruption. Uh, thank you so much to CC for joining us on this conversation. And of course, continuing, what were the main findings? Because um, I I'm sure. The message mainly was to bring to the fore experiences of yes. uh, women. Mm -hmm. Uh, in accessing basic services, like I said earlier on. Mm -hmm. And then we have seen that this, this phenomenon is not new in Zimbabwe. Right. If we look uh, back into history, we look at the Chipangano era. Right. Whereby we had the male, do the male, the, mm -hmm. the male dominated environment. Yes. Whereby males were actually giving, uh, allocating stands to who is going to sell in Zimbabwe. Mm. Women were left out. Yes. And then even now, if we go to as early as um, last week, the yes. Mashurubis. Yes. <laughs> We have a situation whereby there is a, a key economic um, uh, enterprise like yes. the issue of mining. Yes. We don't have women accessing. Mm -hmm. The people who are using the machetes are the males. Right. And the women now, they cannot access uh, the mining. Uh, um, what can I say? The opportunity to mine. Mm. The opportunities to mine. Yes. And what we see then is what Mucha was saying was talking about the issues to do with impunity. Right. It looks like these people are politically connected. Mm -hmm. So this leaves women to bear the brand of corruption. Mm. We are being left out in these key economic activities. Hmm. That's quite interesting. And you know, it, it's actually fascinating how you move from gender based violence and you talk mm. about health, education, resources, and it's all a key factor in actually affecting how how women go about their daily lives. Um, mm -hmm. I remember there was an article a, a few weeks back, I think it was not, not a few weeks back, but in November, that uh, women are now paying uh, uh, for water, sex for water. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's mm -hmm. out of this world. It's yes. crazy. Mm -hmm. And Muchaneta? Yes, and I think, Unique, what makes it worse is something that we just talk about in passing. Yes. Mm -hmm. And no one seems to be wanting to do anything about it. Right. But it is a form of corruption mm -hmm. that is affecting women. Women, right, and we're not doing anything about it. That is why us as TIZ, mm -hmm. we decided to say we want to change policies, especially surrounding sextortion. Mm -hmm. Sextortion is happening, but no one wants to acknowledge that is happening and address it as a specific form of gendered corruption. Right, um, Mette. So, how does Sweden work with anti-corruption globally and in Zimbabwe? Well, I think, first of all, we you have to start with recognizing it on a policy level right. that it's a threat to democracy and yes. it's a threat to economic development yes. and also a threat to social development. Yes. And that's m mainly where we have them women coming mm -hmm. in. And I think in you have to start a, as an international donor and international mm -hmm. community. You start mm -hmm. at your own door. And in Sweden, we have quite strong institutions. Yes. We are not free from corruption. Right. But we have institutions where you can actually seek redress mm -hmm. and actually you have the cases go all the way through court and you have sentences being being carried out right um, and then so what we think is important in our development work and when we work globally mm -hmm. is to stri try to strengthen duty bearers right. and the responsible people which is to, to a large extent politicians mm -hmm. who will then have to sort of have their policies trickle down to all mm -hmm. the institutions right. to make right. sure that this is taken seriously mm -hmm. to make sure that everyone feels that yes it's my duty to carry on this work mm -hmm. I shall not be scared because yes. there's someone here who yes. might do something mm -hmm. yes. and I have to do it because it's the right thing to do yes. and because it will help the poor and the vulnerable people in, in the end mm -hmm. because I would like to point out that corruption is one of the main reasons why many countries cannot fill their, mm. their full potential mm. and actually feed and make sure that their own population goes all the way to where they could be. Yes. And mm. that is not only one country in the world, it's in many countries. But wherever you look, you see that corruption is a main factor for not delivering on economic and social uh, development. Mm, wow, that's that's thought, thought provoking. Obviously, as you start thinking around how how we've how far we've come as Zimbabwe in terms of dealing with issues of corruption. Going back to what Mete said, um, Mucha, um, she's talking about not fearing, mm -hmm. you know, to stand for the right thing. Mm -hmm. But in Zimbabwe, there's a sort of a fear of the unknown, or there's a fear, <laughs> you know, this person uh, belongs to a sort of uh, the higher table, and you can't do anything to mm -hmm. them. How do we? or how do we fight against corruption at the same time 
also bring in the issue of the rule of law. No one is above the law. That issue. How do we deal with it? Precisely. I, I think, like I said before, the issue of impunity. Yes. You cannot have the rule of law yes. and respect for human rights right. where, where impunity resides. Right. So the issue of impunity must be dealt with. Mm -hmm. Anyone who engages in corruption mm -hmm. must be prosecuted to finality mm -hmm. and the law must take its full course mm -hmm. regardless of who they are mm -hmm. and regardless of whether they are politically connected or not. Mm -hmm. So I think with that also comes the issue of protecting whistleblowers because I know corruption happens between two yes, people yes. and there might be one of them who might say I want to expose what happened mm. but as long as we do not have legislation or mechanisms to protect those who might want to come forward mm -hmm. it still poses as a threat so it is also one issue that we've been advocating for to say as we move forward in the anti-corruption fight it is prudent for us as a nation to have a, a whistleblower protection mm. act or legislation in place Hmm, interesting. All right, so Meta, how is Sweden supporting Transparency International? Obviously, they are, you know, uh, going through the process of, and they have actually gone through the process of, you know, getting these findings around, you know, the impact of corruption on women. How uh, is Sweden supporting Transparency International? Yes, we have supported uh, Transparency International here in Zimbabwe for several years already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we are, we are continuing that support because we do think that leads to results yes. and more awareness and that things are happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, partly, I will mention a few of the things. I mean, it's increased political will and responsiveness. Right. A little bit like what I was talking about before, because duty bearers will have to take uh, uh, responsibility and mm -hmm. address yes. corruption in the best of ways. Yes. Uh, it's also strengthened capacity right. and uh, participation of all kinds of stakeholders mm -hmm. in, in these anti-corruption activi activities. And uh, there, as Mucha was mentioning before, we work in three different regions, Harare, Bulawayo, and what where right. they have uh, regional offices. Yes. So, uh, especially in those areas. Uh, for the general public, it's a part of uh, increased awareness, yes. resistance, and reporting this empowerment that we were talking mm. about uh, before. And it's also then, which is very important, improved transparency, mm -hmm. accountability, and integrity both in public and private spheres. Hmm, interesting. So what's happening on Thursday? We hear there's a launch that's taking place, Meta. Well, yes, we <laughs> we do. There's the launch of the uh, of the uh, gender and corruption barometer that we've been talking about today, yes. which is really interesting read for everyone mm -hmm. and then, of course, action afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, but also the 2019 Corruption Perception Index. Right. Uh, which is also something that TIZ is doing, or TI, mm -hmm. I should say, Transparency International is doing in mm -hmm. all countries so yes. this will be the chapter of Zimbabwe mm -hmm. which will be quite interesting to see and I suppose it has to be reminded that it's the perception yes not not the reality yes. but it will be interesting to find out oh wow interesting so on Thursday we have the gendered corruption barometer yes. being uh, launched and where is this it's going to be at the um, venue in Avondale nice. from 9 a.m. to 12 a.m. and we'll be live streaming okay. on our social media pages. I think maybe also just to add on to what Meta said yes. uh, concerning the Corruption Perception yes. Index. This is an index that is published annually by Transparency International, yes. the global movement against corruption. Right. So last year Zimbabwe was on uh, squad 22 mm -hmm. out of 100, signifying high levels of corruption mm. and was also mm -hmm. ranked uh, 160 out of 100. 80 countries. Wow. So that was not good. So we're hoping that uh, with the institutional and legislative frameworks that have been put in place this past year, mm -hmm. there will be a slight improvement, hopefully. If not, it means more work needs to be done, especially in terms of respect of rule of law, right. uh, impunity, yes. uh, etc. But um, we only know on Thursday where we stand as a country. And even if we do improve, it means still there is more work to be done for us. Uh, and we're also launching the um, corruption impact analysis mm -hmm. on tax administration and revenue mobilization. As we all know, corruption also undermines our ability as a nation to generate rate income and yes. foreign direct investment. So we also did a study on that and we'll also be launching it on the 23rd. All right, so I'm going to throw this question to Fadzi. And, uh, you know, the launch is great. You know, mm. you invite people mm. and obviously they get the actual knowledge of, uh, you know, the research that you've done. What's next after that? How do you continue making impact so that women are aware and Zimbabwe is aware that, you know, we need to move away for, from corruption in order for us to develop as a country? 
Okay, um, after the launch, we hope that our findings will influence the policy changes, the policy makers in right. adopting legislation and policies which address this form of uh, gender corruption. Mm -hmm. And also, if we look back to uh, Professor Mtuli uh, 2020 National Budget Statement, mm -hmm. he indicated that the nation has got an interest in adopting what we call a national anti-corruption strategy. Right. So we are pushing for the national anti-corruption strategy to have a gender lenses and also to address the gender impacts of corruption on women as well. Hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> just to add on to yes. what Fazai has also said. Uh, in as much as we are focusing on gender and corruption and how corruption affects women, right. we also believe that women have the power also yes. to contribute to mm -hmm. anti-corruption policies right. that will have a positive bearing on their lives. Right. So we'll also be launching a campaign mm -hmm. that is that seeks to empower women to be able to stand up and assert and even suggest anti-corruption policies mm -hmm. that they believe will be able to develop them further. Oh wow, that's fantastic. And of course, we're discussing the gendered corruption barometer in Zimbabwe. So is it open? Can people come or unfortunately <laughs> it is a closed door <laughs> event but like I said yes. we will be live streaming from our Facebook page. Right. Uh, you just go on Facebook and look for Transparency International Zimbabwe. Fantastic. And also follow our Twitter handle mm -hmm. TIZIM Info. Right. We'll be updating it continuously on the day. Oh that's fantastic and uh, you did say that the research uh, we can actually get it on your website. Definitely. And what's your website? Our website is www.tizim.org Oh fantastic. <laughs> Well, thank you so much to Muchaneta from Transparency International, Fadzai from uh, Transparency International, and of course to Mette Sinagren from the Swedish Embassy for coming to tell us a little bit about the gendered corruption barometer in Zimbabwe and how far uh, we've come in terms of fighting against corruption and the impact of corruption uh, towards women. And of course, we wish you all the best. Uh, obviously, Heart and Soul will definitely be talking and writing about it, so that's going to be quite exciting. And if they have questions around you know who to reach out to and how they can also be part of the movement where do they go uh, Twitter mm -hmm. like I said yes. TIZIM, info, TIZIM underscore info right our Facebook page Transparency International Zimbabwe mm -hmm. our website we are also located in number 96 Central Avenue mm -hmm. they are welcome to just pop in and ask Great. for information or any questions in Bulawayo we are located at suit number 211 mm -hmm. um, my see uh my see a building right that's between corner 9th and 4th street great and in mutare we're at number five kylo's flats in mutare oh fantastic well thank you to everyone who joined us on the conversation and uh you know keep going on the transparency international page obviously so you can get more updates around how the organization is fighting against corruption and special thanks to swedish embassy of course in a little bit we'll be right back with the movie review segment but thank you so much to our game changes and you can cross over with me on www.hstv.co.zw good morning You're listening to Hard and Soul Radio Station. Station.